The recording's on. Thank you, ma'am. Was your chair for made for you and your belt? No, no. <laughs> Let me hold the gun. No. <laughs> You can have the radio. <laughs> You're good at that. I miss you. The recording is all the <clears throat> Miss Christie, can you hear me? Affirmative. It says something about share content or camera. It says participant screen sharing disabled. Oh, never mind. I'm in the wrong thing. There we go. Got it. Thanks for fixing it. If you have any trouble, you may need to log in as you because Chad Sweet is the co host and not Council Chambers. Yeah, I've got, okay, copy that. So I'm glad that we'll be able to reverse it. This company. Can you recommend it at one time? Are they all like that? That's why I bring my eyes. That's the problem. All right. My card everywhere. I just need some stupid stuff done. Now I just want to win the lottery. The COVID lottery. Yeah. That would be nice. Yes, it would be. I got vaccinated in Crip County, so I can get that better odds. So it's not where you live, it's actually where you were vaccinated. I believe it's where you were vaccinated. Wow. Oh boy. Yeah. Wow. I will say that I heard that in the during the early vaccination period, there were a lot of people in Gearhart, firefighter, um, pull pullovers at the Oregon Convention Center that I suspect are not actually. People who have bought this one because the fireman's ball were putting them on. <laughs> you know, it's the first responder. Really? Oh, oh, yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. I heard there were quite a few Gearheart Fire um, and Gearheart Fire Hat people in the York Convention Center. And I know that all of our first responders were getting their shots here. So I have a feeling that those were people that had been donated to. Uh, Yes, there's a benefit to that. Well, you know, we didn't really ask for people to come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just get it done. Just got it done. Just yeah. get it done. Mm -hmm. All right. Just, just... Gary, we are recording now in case any of you wanted to know. Mm -hmm. And it's up on the goals list. I put together a list of goals in addition to some other tasks and some of the other things that we're working on. It's more than three so is this what we're going to use moving forward? I can refer to it. Uh, but I think maybe starting, I mean, where we'd like to start there, we, I, I can use this to talk about these goals on here in a little bit more detail. This has for you to take with you. Yeah, it pretty well matches goals list. And I can put it up on screen for the public. I'm going to do it. So, like, why don't we just place them and evacuate the supplies of workforce following the board? Just some more information. Here, hello, answer. So this is a new thing of copying that chapel it's Okay, uh six thirty. Okay, it looks like so far just us and Christy. Good weather, I'll wait there. 
Looks like it's on it. It's infested. Well, actually, somebody's grandpa gave it to me. So. Oh, nice. Okay. I'm going to gather in the uh, June 29th, 2021 Charter uh, City Council work session. And uh, tonight, uh, uh, hopefully, if we can do this in an hour, it'd be just great, but we stay a little longer if we need to. Um, we want to have a discussion about council goals, uh, a little bit about homelessness and parking. And I just want to say right off the top on that, that anything that we discuss or think about doing in the future, uh, we should have top of mind public health and safety and treating people the same, whether they're a resident or a visitor. Um, and uh, construction noise, specifically we're talking about uh, commercial, in other words, builders, commercial construction, specifically probably around the weekend. Um, so that would kind of want to hone down a little bit, if you can. but um, of course, when we go around, any other thoughts on the part? So we walk on. So uh, with regard to council goals, um, so I just want to say that um, a couple of things that Chad and I have been working on over the last couple of months, you all have seen this, and uh, I want to just point out, this was the one that came in the packet. Everything from number four, starting with number 14 to down to 24, those were all actually counselor's suggestions from his last uh, um, administrator review. So actually everything from there down. And, and then when he was on his leave, there were some others that I thought were still topical. And so Christy added those in December or January, it's probably January, but uh, that, would, that is um, that green bar below. So those were all, those are all from 14 down, basically, from his administrative review. We gave him a lot of goals to work on at that time. I just want to point that out. I worked up a dashboard, which was kind of my top of my project about a month or so ago, and then had some review of that with, uh, with Chad. Well, he was concurrently on his own working on another program that he has taken both information from mine and information from this and turned it into this. And I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thank you. Mayor Council Nelson. What I've been working on is, is still a work in progress. You know, uh, the team and I have been working on this and I'm talking about some of these projects. Want to put all of these items on here just so that the council and uh, the public eventually will have a good understanding of everything that the city is going to help us make better decisions when we want to organize our goals moving forward uh, and to understand the workload that we are all under, including the council and the planning commission. Uh, there's not a lot of planning commission on this yet, but I think eventually on another section we'll incorporate their goals list too, so that the city council and the planning commission. We nearly got a little bit better communication to be on the same page of what's important to both. So, what I did so far with this is I'm using some programs uh, that help track these projects, and they will also assist my team in sharing these projects so that we can update them, have task lists, and uh, just good communication. Not everything needs to be automated, but we're going to automate a little bit of this to help us communicate a lot better. And make sure that we stay on that. The color coding now is just really basic. Green are things that are you know, in route. They're they're pretty well on schedule. Of course, the schedule can change, and the dates sometimes will be uh, something that we're going to have to move around depending on what's happening. The yellow are things that uh, are, are kind of. Uh, uh, in, in getting closer to the danger zone, there's complications, or we're behind, uh, or we feel like this is something that we need to um, kind of bring to the forefront for the staff to pay attention to and for us to continue to work forward. 
Red items uh, are things that we are behind on, or we haven't been successful yet, uh, or we just weren't able to complete. <clears throat> uh, for example, the ridge path extension has taken a very long time. I marked that red. But some of the tasks that are under there, which this is a complete list, are uh, things that uh, are moving forward with a new schedule of mine. So the first part of this pretty well mirrors the council's goals list. At the very at page three, approximately line 81 and down, there's some extra and additional projects that I added on for communication sales. <coughs> After that, there's the goals list that is specific that uh, Mary might have talked about already in regards to some of the things that I was to work on specifically and personally. And we can talk about adding some of those others in there or changing the design, but this is a draft. Uh, it is working. And I think that this will be in one of the goals within this project also is for each individual action item to have more of a detailed uh, appendix, if you will, with some of the items that uh, need to be discussed or the conversations or what we're thinking or what some of the issues have been or, or what the synopsis is of what the council really wants. So over time, we'll have another document that will go along with this that will be more specific. So that when we talk about things, we can update that document and you can be sure that we are communicating correctly with what you want. So that's kind of how this lays out. Any questions from there to start? Thank you. I am looking for improvement on this. This is this is something that is um, fairly new, but I think it's powerful. The, now, Mary, you had some ideas in regards to go through the goals list and, and keeping with time. You know, if you want to just touch upon some of these or the actual goals list that we provided for the public, uh, you can discuss those going down, or if you'd like an update on specific, specific projects. Uh, I'm Willing to just query the council on if you want more detail tonight on this. I think, would it be safe to say, can we have a consensus that we'll use this going forward rather than this or this? Because it, those things are all included here, right? Mm -hmm. So we'll use this. I agree. Sense. And then I guess I would just want to hear right now what do we need to accomplish more tonight on this from the counselors? To me, the goal, if we're, a goals discussion is a true goals discussion lasts longer than we are. So to me, if we want to do that, we should dedicate the appropriate time to it. To talk more in depth about these or things that are missing. All of the above. Prioritizing just our priority from last year, the year before, may not in fact be our priority today. I don't have anything off the top of my head that I would change, but that doesn't mean. And I, I believe we should always be looking towards the best interest of our community based on what information we have. So, some of these things may get, or you take advantage of an opportunity to do something, even though it may not have been at the top of the list, it makes more sense to, to take it on at that point because of X, Y, or So to me, that's maybe add more things. I, just, I, I think it's a lengthy, lengthier discussion than just a presentation. Here it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have two additions that. I didn't see anywhere and they may be in this document. Uh, business committee is up and running. It's an ad hoc committee. So that's required time and energy of staff and council. And uh, uh, Rita has this 
uh, desire to uh, possibly have a tree city or um, saving legacy trees. I'm not sure what it's even called. Like they're kind of new. They're kind of going up. They're kind of better. They need to kind of be at it. And I guess that would be at a time when you're saying uh, we're going to spend an hour on it and really. Madam Mayor, take a look at it's on here. 90, oh, it's yeah. oh, very good. Thank you. Both of those things are on there, but they don't have any dates. They don't have any status. To it. Right. And I think that an interactive meeting, you know, specifically about goals would be good. And that would be after we develop the synopsis of each one of these so we can talk about it in more detail and we're almost prepared. It was a good start of consolidating everything, getting some idea of what we're up to, and then we can move forward to those. Setting session. But, so, do you think in a couple of months we should reset then and just have an hour to just talk about this? I agree with Dan that we need at least an hour to, to delve into this. I really like this, it's a good start, but I don't think we can do it really quickly. I think it requires a lot. I think we should have an open ended meeting that uh, can go upwards of two hours or something like that. So we don't go, well, we've only got an hour and already it's taken us 15 <laughs> minutes and we're, we're still looking at the document in its raw state. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? That's, I agree with Dan, this, this is more uh, in depth. And if we're gonna go in depth, then we need more time. Well, this gives us a structure to yes. lead, yes. Yes. To lead with moving forward, you all have a copy. Yes. So you could be thinking about what you would have to say in that hour that we would schedule. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, uh, yeah. I'll just add that the Treasury Department has done their preliminary guidance for the next round of how federal funds can be used. Um, it, that guidance should be finalized uh, in July, but water pipe and water projects are one um, use that's explicitly allowed and how they've defined that's pretty broad. And so I don't know if that's going to impact any priorities, but that might be a kind of unanticipated funds that are limited and how they can be used, but that is one of the one of the allowable uses. Is this from the uh, American Rescue Act? The last one that was the one that was passed earlier this year by Congress that the state has the money but have it. To the, to the jurisdictions. Exactly. So we did budget some in water, did we not? Yeah, we kept a lot of that in infrastructure and then some of that into park infrastructure uh, and some other things. So yeah, we were pretty conservative with that. So that is it. And that guidance should be finalized by the Treasury Department, I think, mid July is what they anticipated. So through July and August, we've got a lot going on currently. We've got, as you can see, a lot of things that are um, processed and some very important in front of you know, the fire station. Uh, and so I think that after August, we'll be a little bit more freed up to probably get into the goal setting session. So maybe sometime in September, October. That's soon enough for you. But it's a can you can you just explain a little bit more of the content because we'll be looking at it more closely at home. Just take number 12. It says water rights and water rates study. And then there's like four things past that that I, looks like are associated with it. Is that just explain that like that? That's true. Yeah. So the heading is in blue, and uh, that way we can give it color to the actual item as it's going through as a whole. But the end of it, some of the individual tasks, and this isn't complete yet. So we'll be updating this and then sending you new documents. We'll locate the consultant uh, for a rate study. Uh, Mark and I have been talking with uh, and about the water rates that we have. I think you're right. We need to know that we're on track with our modern water master plan and the rising costs and things such as that. So by getting a consultant to help us study our rates, we can make some future decisions. It's a plan. Update the water conservation plan that is due. Uh, this is a process that we have to have done by March 2022. 
And that is something that takes some time. We're actually going to be starting that in September by providing uh, all sorts of documentation, usage, and, uh, and ratios, and, and you know, the amount of water we're making and, and how we're doing it. Uh, and putting that into a conservation plan. And then also we'll be talking about what to do in case of emergencies and other conservation measures that we can put in place. We have some basic ones now, and uh, the city is getting ready to do some blog posting about conserving water here uh, within the next couple of days. Uh, water loss percentage project is important to that because we're going, we need to know what we're making and what we're selling and what the difference is. That's required by law. And so we want to know what our ratio is. Is it 20% that we're losing? Is it 10%? You know, what is an acceptable level, which I think by the state's recommendations, it's 10% systems are going to uh, to leave, but can be better. So that's going to take some work. The media project is part of that. And it's one of the reasons that we did that. And the database update is constantly working. And Chris has spent a lot of time repairing, fixing, making more efficient our database so it's accurate and so that we can be human making sure we're billing everybody we're supposed to be billing, and we can help us with that water uh, loss percentage. Okay, thank you. I mean, that helps. Thank you. Acronyms are always interesting. What does DOC mean? Declaration of uh, Commitment. Cooperation. Cooperation, thank you. That's going to be the document that comes out of our uh, two years of help. Uh, meeting with Oregon Solutions. And it puts together all of the ideas that we gained were something that cities, counties, individuals, and others can do to help with the uh, problems and issues around them. So that document then kind of binds us to the idea that we will move forward with some of these things if applicable to our city and if possible. That we will have some kind of forward motion. It doesn't say that you shall do anything, but it keeps us on track, kind of like a hazard mitigation plan that periodically we can go in and take a look at how we're performing and if we're doing anything or if we're moving the needle at all. And then the council and then we hold ourselves accountable. So we approved Gerhardt's portion in February uh, because we. Had a lot of I remember the document. I just couldn't figure out what the DOC yeah, yeah. is. <laughs> that was just one portion of it. Right. Yeah. I'll have a better update. I have another meeting on July. Any other questions right now? Comments? So if we have suggestions, we just email you. Please call me, email me, come back to copy. All sorts of ways. Fly me down the city streets. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for your work on this. Um, I think I think there's some improvement from what we have. Oh, yeah. And uh, so late summer, somewhere in there, we'll circle around to this again and um, have a more in depth discussion. There's no doubt. Thank you. Okay, so homelessness and parking. Um, I just gave you that little preamble when I opened the meeting up. And um, really, I think um, I would like to hear from Chief Bowman and from Peter uh, just to get your thoughts all out there. And then maybe we can. I, I can start. Um, I, I read the Grant Pass ruling, which is the latest ruling, pretty narrowly, actually. Uh, it was very clear from comments that were made by members of the Grants Pass City Council that um, they were trying to target homeless and trying to adopt policies that would um, essentially make being homeless illegal in the city of Grants Pass. So if you can have reasonable regulations and restrictions like a noise ordinance or hours at a park is open, that's perfectly fine as long as that you know, it's, um, you know, there are reasonable restrictions and they're enforced neutrally. So it doesn't matter whether you're have hundreds of millions of dollars or a penny in your pocket. You know, if you're in that park at 1130, 
you're going to either get a written warning or cited. And that's how our police have always handled this. Home, being homeless is not a protected class under federal law, um, but it is homeless, being homeless is also not a crime. And so if, um, if cities are adopting regulations that uh, criminalize things that are beyond someone's control, then um, those are going to get struck down. And that's what happened in Grants Pass. The Grants Pass case basically said that people should be allowed to sleep um, and they should be allowed to have some minimal amount of blankets uh, to sleep. That doesn't mean that they can block a sidewalk. You know, it doesn't mean that they can, they're, it doesn't mean that they can sleep wherever they want, whenever they want, however they want. It means that you can't criminalize the act of sleeping. And so that, in my mind, is very different than um, building, I'm not going to call it a domicile, um, but like building a structure in order to live it. And, and in fact, I think if, if cities do that, and I got a continuing legal education course with the the then head of the ACLU on this topic, I think that actually exposes the city to a lot of risk because our state building codes, which are statewide, the stated purpose for them is public safety. And so if we say to people, if you build a structure that you sleep in, going through all the permits and all the inspections and all that, and we make you do it, and if you don't comply, you're going to not be able to habitate, inhabit it, and then we say to someone else, you don't have to build a structure that's in compliance that you could habitate and that's in compliance with all these codes. I mean, are we saying like their life means less because the whole purpose of these codes are to keep people safe. And um, I think too that it then makes it look like it's selective enforcement if we're making some people pull permits and others. And so I think that any, you know, I, I've said before, any, anything needs to be focused on health and safety. That's the health and safety of all people. So people that are housed and unhoused, and we need to make sure that they're being, um, that everyone's being treat, treated evenly and fairly. Uh, it's well worth going through our stuff. I, I actually don't read the grants past case to say that someone can't sleep in a car. I read the case to say that they can't sleep in the city with, uh, whether it's blankets or sleeping bag, they can do that. But um, that's really as far as the judge went. And, and the reason the judge went that far in my mind is because the record and what the city councilors and others in the community said about homeless was just so hateful. Um, and these truly were designed to punish homeless for being homeless. And when confronted with the record like that, um, yeah, you're, you're, your things going to get your ordinances are going to get struck down as well as they should have been because these were not matters of health and safety. These were about punishing a status and that status to be homeless. So we would, of course, interview, not that any of you would ever want to do anything like that, but if if you would, uh, we wouldn't be able to do that because that would be illegal. Uh, and so let the chief kind of say what, what he thinks about it. Let's see, how would I think about this? I know that two years down the road, we have another city, uh, state legislation with new laws that will kick in that are different than the laws now. We have a new law that's going to be in now that we shall store and maintain safely homeless individuals' property if we should confiscate it, or if there's a homeless camp even, and we remove that camp, we have to maintain their property for up to 30 days. It's, it's difficult and it does become segregated that the $800 motor home, we tell them that here's your tickets and if you don't move, we're gonna tell them impound it. Uh, versus your zombie mobile where five people are living in it alongside the road and they're not going to get out of it and nobody's going to tell what, what talking to the city attorney 
what reasonable force do we have to remove that motor? I, I mean, I, I think that one of the, what I would say, and, and I approach it from legal risk, is that, you know, what does it mean to have a homeless camp? And in my mind, and, you know, based off of the legislative history, that's a well-established camp for a period of time. So if you're going in and, you know, I mean, there, if you've been to Delta Park in Portland, you can see, uh, or, or is it Walnut Grove or Hazelnut Grove, whatever they call the, um, the campground near University of Portland, where they have wooden structures that have been built for human habitation, which I think puts the city of Portland at tremendous risk, particularly when allowing people to heat them with oil lamps and other lamps, of course, they're going to burn down. And there's real risk of human life. I mean, I think that connecting with pe people with social services on day one after they spent the night here. Um, and if our goal is to get them off the streets and get them into housing, which I think should be the goal, because um, what kind of life is it to be um, living on the streets in that much danger? You know, what we would do is coordinate with the county and make sure that they're connected with county services. And if they need a ride, to, and Chief um, does this, if they need a ride to Astoria, we make sure that they safely get to Astoria so they're not, you know, walking along the highway. Um, if it's if it's an abandoned vehicle or if it's a vehicle that um, is inoperable, we have a code that specifically deals with that that, that allows us to tow it. And... You know, if the city has to bear the cost of that tow, um, then we have to bear the cost of that tow. But, you know, I, I had a city where we had a situation with some, some houseless people and they, they were doing, I guess, what you term car camping. And the park was owned by the city, but it was in the county. So it created all sorts of issues that I would not have had if it was in the city. And those people um, violently assaulted the neighboring property owner, at which point all of them were trespassed for 90 days, the property owner and the two houses individuals, because you it appeared to be mutual combat and all people need to be treated exactly the same. Um, and then, you know, ultimately we towed those vehicles because the individuals were then arrested. And we normally would have charged them a fee for having the vehicles there, but we didn't. And so when we got a call from the ACLU, my response was, we're not charging them an impound fee. In fact, we are picking up the tab ourselves and they're free to pick them up and move them when they're out of jail. And the ACLU was no longer interested in, in that case whatsoever because we weren't trying to punish their status as being homeless. We were trying to, if anything, safeguard their property. And so, in fact, that's a technique that I will use. I had a person in another city that was in a traffic media and also suffered from narcolepsy. And there were two um, instances where, uh, in one instance, the police chief and another, an officer, where he fell in the traffic lane and they ran out there and, you know, got him picked up and, um, and, I called the one of the main lawyers at Volunteers for the City of Chang off. I described the circumstances that say, can we ban people from hand handling on that median? I don't care if they're on the adjacent sidewalk, but not on that median because it's a risk to that person's life. And they had no problem with it whatsoever. So um, in my mind, if they see that the city's acting in good faith and trying to help people, we're not going to get sued. If you're a grants pass, and I can name other cities that have approached it from a truly punitive standpoint, yeah, you've got serious rewards. And that's basically what we're doing now. I mean, we don't even have a situation or any situation that even looks like Seaside at 12th Avenue and McKenna come there. Um, so we haven't come to that. I mean, the last two motorhomes that we have to city picked up the cost for towing. They were truly abandoned. I mean, it, it got so bad that the people that were using them thought it was too disgusting to live <laughs> them anymore. So we told them the the issue that that we're having, especially like with the district attorney's office, as far as 
the taking of the crimes or even the jail. I mean, we're doing site and releases still on warrants. And I did a site and release on a felony warrant on somebody. Is uh, and they're being a little bit more selective about who they're taking in. We there's new policy out now, but uh, somebody says they have a cough and we end up ER before we get to the hospital. There's taken straight up to the jail, and as you're taking them out, they say, you know, I don't feel very well. The jail tells you to go to Columbia Memorial before you end up bringing them back. It's it's where we're going to have a possible situation because most of the homeless that we have here are out of sight, out of mind. People don't even know they're here. Uh, the last big ruckus one was the guy in the motorhome that he was moving his vehicle constantly. But yeah, he was spending the night in it. However, because of Jim George's ruling, I couldn't prove that he was spending the night in it because I couldn't see him sleeping in it. And when you knock on the door, they're no longer sleeping under our old ordinance. So there's no violation there for me to be able to do anything about it. Our car is a little bit different, but at, it still comes to the point. Someone comes, they pitch one or two tents in the city park. They are really, truly homeless. They don't want to move. They don't want to give me their name, which most of them don't give you their name. Placing them under arrest for a city ordinance violation and doing what? I started tearing down their tent. Right. I mean, it's it comes down to this, and especially on my own body cam video, will probably be the worst case against us for handling that versus how we're handling it now. Uh, finding out what their intent is, and maybe in a day or two, they're moving on on their own. Good enough. I've had, I've had the motorhomes break down. The last one was down in Dairy Queen. The owner of Dairy Queen wanted to trespass them immediately, which means they would have had to leave the property, but the motorhome stayed there. And when I explained this to her, she said, well, maybe we won't trespass them. Maybe we'll give them some time to fix their motorhome. And about six and a half hours later, their motorhome was gone. So sometimes not taking immediate enforcement action is the best de-escalation of these situations. And I know people want things immediately to happen, but sometimes it's just best not to go in there, phone enforcement, uh, monitor the situation and hopefully with work from us to be taken care of. We had Douglas out here in the forerunner. You guys remember Douglas? Uh, I pushed him down here. He slept for six nights in our city hall. We paid for the mechanic to fix his car, tow it up there. Two days later, he's back here again, broke down. I made arrangements for him up in Rainier to be at the halfway house. I had transportation set up for him until he wanted to take his kayak and all his belongings with him and the bus wouldn't take him. Uh, but eventually I towed him out of his car. I had something, as I refer to, equal or better for him to go to. And he wasn't really too eager to do that. So I kind of forced his hand. He ended up getting a ride uh, by an individual at the Rainier. He spent a month up there before whatever happened. Then he camped out across from Safeway. You guys remember seeing him there. An individual gave him a black van to actually, you see, he wanted to tour the coast. So someone gave him a van, and the last photo I've seen of Douglas, he was on the south side of Neocomi Mountain past the tunnel, and he holding the cardboard sign that said, need gas. <laughs> okay. So everybody wanted Douglas out right away, except for John Allen. John Allen liked him and served him coffee all the time. We fed Douglas because something that, that worked with Douglas is if he was hungry, he left people alone. He'd talk to himself and do everything else. 
But when he was hungry was when he'd be out on the corners asking people for money. And if he didn't hand them a buck or two bucks, then he was pretty profound of what he felt of your generosity. So I bought him pizzas. My wife made him lunches. I bought other food from him, from buds, sandwiches, drinks. And he was happy for six days here in the parking lot. No one even knew that he was here. But we were trying to get him to move on without bringing in the ACLU or end up in a lawsuit or whatever because of one individual. I mean, that's, I think it's a dumb way of doing law enforcement and I don't like being sued. Right, and I think that, so the distinction I'd make would be if someone's sleeping in our park during the hours that the park is open, then we would treat anyone the same. We would allow them to do that. Um, you know, just like if someone's sleeping on the beach, they can sleep on the beach on their towel or what have you. If they're pitching a tent, it doesn't, it shouldn't matter whether they're homeless or not. I mean, you're not allowed, the park is closed, you're not allowed to sleep in the tent um, when the park is closed. And it has nothing to do with your status of being homeless or housed. If it was two 10 year olds that lived around the corner and just wanted to play camp and tent, you know, I would want them to be treated this, in the same manner. So if, if um, you know, there are examples of cities that have drafted sit lie ordinances, San Francisco being one of them, that have been upheld by courts. And, and the reason is because they were reasonable regulations and they cited you regardless. So if you were housed and you were sitting on the street, you got cited. And there were a bunch of housed people that lived in the neighborhood that for whatever reason had sat down and got cited by the police. And so San Francisco was able to demonstrate that it was not based on status. Um, I would not recommend a sit lie ordinance post this grants past the case. But I would say that, you know, if someone pitches a tent in the park, that we should tell them they free to sleep in the park when the park's open. They're free to sleep in front of the city hall or in the city hall parking lot at night if they have a blanket and pillow and sleeping bag, but they have to follow the same rules as everyone else. Um, because it's the same expectations. I know lawyers that have been cited in Portland for jaywalking outside of the district courthouse. If they're citing lawyers, they should be citing homeless. And the fact that they're not opens them up to selective prosecution, um, selective enforcement claims, and that's what we want to avoid. So, I mean, I like the fact that we're using a common sense approach. I think the chief does a good job of monitoring the situation. And um, if we have a policy of this is our policy and it's being enforced, and we have a camping policy in the city of Gerhard anyway, you need to pull a permit if you want to do it in your own yard. So it's really tough for, uh, for people to say, well, and we don't allow it in the park. Um, so it just has nothing to do with hustle status that was developed well before there was any issue. And if that's the sort of record we want, and when the ACLU sees that sort of record, they're not going to bring a case because what they want to, the entities they want to bring a case against are bad actors, and we're not a bad actor. I commend you for the way that you're handling these folks. I mean, I really do. Um, and I really like the approach that you're using. And I and you used one word that really, uh, I really keyed into, and that is what is their intent. You know, just knowing what their intent is gives you an idea so you can get the false rolling if you need to, or maybe you don't need to and you can make that assessment. Um, so, I mean, something we'd have to look at then, or the, you guys would have to look at. Uh, our city parks open 24 hours a day. So putting it on a scale, weighing it, because I know that there's people there at five o'clock in the morning. I come on shift five o'clock in the morning, those people at the park at five o'clock in the morning, believe it or not. We have people walking all night long in gear, two, three o'clock in the morning. I have walkers that walk around the golf course with their flashlights. So if we're going to put hours of limitation on the park because of 
maybe future one or two individuals or five or six individuals that may show up at a given time. Uh, but we're going to do limitation seven days a week on the citizens that are now using the park every day or weekly. Uh, where's the balance in doing that? I mean, we have to look at all of that. And I, it still comes down to when, when somebody's broke down, now that you guys made me a line item, you know, make it easier to track, we'll spend the money to help them get on their way because to be honest with you, they don't want to be in Gear Hard Oregon. And, and the ones that do show up here, I'd ask them, I said, I said, why are you sleeping here? Because I know you hang out there in the seaside and their common answer is, is well, I've got unsafe down there. Your heart's a safer place to be. And it's kind of like, well, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so but that's what that's what happens when a city does not enforce and that it becomes unsafe for houseless people. And then they go to neighboring cities that don't have the same level of social services and you really can't provide the assistance they need. Which comes back to the broader question of, you know, these are why you enforce the regulations. This is why people are engaging in violent behavior towards other houses individuals that they should be arrested. And, you know, if, if I was walking down the sidewalk in Portland in a suit and I punched someone in the face, you better believe that I would not be getting released, you know, 30 minutes later, I would be going through some things. And, um, <laughs> you know, but if, if a houseless person were to do the same thing, they might not even be cited or, or arrested. And, and, you know, that that's not how you maintain law and order. And so I, you know, that's, that again is why it's so important to treat everyone equally regardless of status. And with ORS, you know, what is it, 203077, the humane homeless policy that came out two and a half years ago? Yeah. You know, I still believe, honestly, the city is the legislature required you to do it. We really need the, a policy. <clears throat> that stand along uh, where we're going to stand or where you guys believe that we should be handling the homeless and we can base ordinances or base a new ordinance rather than these other ones that we have on that and doing other other steps that I talked to you about uh, parking, you know, on Marion and Pacific Way, eliminate RVs, no RV parking in that stretch. Uh, we will get greater compliance if we post signs than if you don't post signs. Because 98% of the people that live in this city, and we pass an ordinance, they don't know that there's an ordinance to it. Yeah. You know, I mean, now granted, come 4th of July, we're going to have all the signs up that says if it flies or explodes, it's illegal. But yet, there's still going to be all kinds of things that fly or explode. Because they think it's a constitutional right to make fireworks on the 4th of July and the weekend after, and the weekend after, and the weekend after. Um, but we have, to, we have to just, I think, my personal opinion, and that's what my guys have been doing, when it truly comes to a, the homeless person, uh, yeah, we are moving very slowly with them just for the fact that not only is it a humane thing to do, but we get more compliance than what's happening in some neighboring cities. <laughs> And the last thing I want to do is fill our pull barn up or have order up another cargo container to store all this stuff and inventory it because it's a waste of time. 
I just had one at Pomberg's lot. He was cam camped on Pomberg's lot, but Pomberg's went down there with me because it's on their private land. And I knew the individual, but I wanted them there to where if he wasn't going to move, trespass, and then we would have moved him, but they would have been responsible for all the stuff. And I actually stayed with them for about 45 minutes, gave them garbage bags, told them to take the garbage bags that he had all his stuff in, take his stuff out, put my new stuff, put his stuff in my new bags that were bigger, heavier, nicer, then put all his trash in the other bags. And if he made it all nice little trash pile, he could leave it there. He didn't have to take it with him. And he gave me his needles so I could properly dispose of them. Those little things for him, I think, was more of a pleasant experience leaving. Now, granted, he shouldn't have been there to begin with, but he was. So you've already got it there. We did that. Uh, palm birds were happy. They had to load up some trash and throw it in a big dumpster, but it was all picked up in bag form rather than running around with gloves on and trash grabbers picking up all of his stuff. Yeah. And it worked out. I mean, he'll be back probably two or three months is we kicked him out before. Super important that you tell the stories, yeah. I think, because that's how we all learn. But, you know, what's the right thing to do? What is really happening in our neighborhoods? And uh, thoughts from anybody? When you go elsewhere, you realize how fortunate we are here. But I, I was just thinking, and I also commend your compassion and common sense pragmatism in your police. Do you see the same attitude in other police agencies, north and south? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had I had an individual, he's not homeless, but I had an individual and I gave him a ride twice back to his dad's place because his dad brought him here and dropped him off and then drove <laughs> off. And he's 42 years old and he's he's a menace, not harmful to anybody, but he's just a menace. Seaside's dealt with him four times today. So I think that when you're dealing with the same individuals over and over on a daily basis, uh, it may wear thin. We haven't had that issue here where we're dealing with the same person over and over and over. I mean, the only one I can think about was Douglas. And Douglas was, you know, minute on a chart of being a nuisance. If we want to come up with just, and I'm thinking like one page, Policy. I'm not talking about huge amounts of detail, but more the philosophy that the council can give guidance. I guess that's what it is. We're putting our uh, what we believe our truths are and how we can um, help people and um, be passionate. Um, who writes that? Well, if we're with well, the compassionate piece was dealt with, so it was the question is, do we want to designate? Thank you so much for doing the race with your hand. To talk about homeless in your heart. So, if we, if we were to say that in that statute, it doesn't allow camping and or sleeping rather in city parks anyway. But if we were to say that this is a designated spot for people to sleep, and then sleeping anywhere else would be prohibited unless there wasn't sufficient space in the area that we said for where people could sleep, that would be one way that we would do it. And that would again, I mean, we're not anyone that you know. Anyone that slept, I mean, 
it's not about camping, it's about sleeping and it's saying if you want to do it, this is where it is. Uh, we could do that. Um, but we do have to have, we either have a place designated for them to sleep or unless it's an area that's closed. And I guess I didn't realize like parks were open 24 hours a day. Um, but if, if it's, um, I mean, that's what we would do and be comply with the federal case and the statutes. And then the new statute that got passed is very ambiguous. It's like a reasonable circumstances standard. Oh, the warm and dry? Yeah. It's that we can have reasonable regulations. So, like, we used to have a noise ordinance that said we could have a you know, you could have a reasonable amount of noise, and you know that didn't hold up either. So um, I don't know exactly what they were going to do, but it would be enforceable because there's no such thing as a reasonable way out. It turns out a reasonable way. <laughs> so if we had a place for them designated for sleeping, we didn't have to be in our jurisdiction. Could we rent an acre of land up down the highway? And say this is the area we've designated for sleeping. You may go there and sleep as long as you want. We have to give them services. I, my opinion, seeing what's gone up in other jurisdictions that have attempted that, uh, the next thing you know is that we are providing a place for them to live. That's basically what it is. Village for them to live. Next thing you know is, well, we need to provide some sanitation. Right. Next thing you know is, you know, you have people in here that need some mental health services. Let's try to get the mental health services. You guys need to do that. Uh, city of Portland fell into the next thing you know is they were after the city for biggest security. So they had the policemen patrol in it. Well, then they cried. They didn't want the cops there because they didn't feel safe. So now they have the park rangers dressed in green <laughs> that are patrolling. If we build it, they will come. So my suggestion is we don't build anything. And what we have right now and what we are dealing with right now, if we can kind of maintain that, especially through the summer, because we really don't have an issue in November, December, February. We don't have this issue. But so far through June, it's still been pretty mundane. And if if you guys want to pass an ordinance closing the park at 10 p.m. and it doesn't open up until 8 a.m., uh, I'm going to drive around and yell at people and tell them to get out of the park because it's closed and no fence, no gate, no nothing. <laughs> you know, you walk up from the beach or anywhere. We got picnic tables there. And who's going to and half the people, even if we do put signs, great big, huge signs. You might have to sleep in the park to police. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I do think we should have, have some type of ordinance because it's nice to have that ordinance that I could then work with when I really, you know, when it's needed. <clears throat> but I don't think we need, again, my opinion, go to extremes of limiting or changing behaviors of many because of maybe a few incidents or maybe more than a few incidents we're going to have here and there. I, I don't think we need to do that. I still would like the city council to amend the parking ordinance, say no RVs on Marion, but you know, from Pacific Way to First and from Marion up to the end of Pacific Way. Let's just eliminate RVs from being up there. It 
opens up more parking for people that want to be in cars that want to enjoy it. We've had little league, not little league, t-ball, baseball going on up here in the park almost every night because they used to play down at the old school. They've been using the park up here. And a lot of parents are up there parking. I mean, oh, you guys may not have noticed it, but there's a ton of cars at 6.30, 7 o'clock at night, and you think, are they still all down at the beach? No, they're little kids with a stick hitting a ball off of the tee. So it, it'd be nice to open that up. And I would say that in the last month, I've had more 400,000 to 800,000 RVs camping overnight up there than zombie mobiles. Yeah, I, that's been a really long, long-standing concern. When I used to bike around, and when you're biking around your heart, you know, when you make that uh, right turn there on off of Marion on the pathway, when there's a RV there, I mean, that just always struck me as uh, dangerous for the bicycles, particularly. And of course, all the kids that are coming off the South Ocean and down that hill, they all stop at the stop sign. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think that that would be, that would also, I think, for the citizens that we have here that really are displeased about RV camping and stuff like that, that would help move it along. And it could actually even, um, it'd, be, it'd be a bigger fine that I'd put on the car. I'm not going to put the $10 nice city parking ticket on it. I'm actually, I'll use a different UTC that will go to the registered owner of the thing and not the driver because the driver's probably sleeping in the back of it. <laughs> <laughs> and then the registered owner can do it. Well, I, I would like to just volunteer myself to, um, I don't know if I'll get it done for this council meeting, but I might be able to, if I get it to you by Friday, then we can put it under our old business, because we've discussed this at council now. Um, so let me write a very, just a, like a mission statement, if you will, for homelessness that is supportive of people in that predicament. And um, maybe a few bullet points, I kind of captured what, uh, what the chief and what Peter has said. Uh, and you, know, you guys can kind of react to that. It will just keep our conversation going. If you guys have thoughts about it, um, you know, just send me an email and I will include them and we can just have a little more discussion because I'd rather have multiple discussions and if it takes us months to get it done, that's okay. Um, because we're learning and we're educating ourselves and we're educating the public um, and, you know, maybe we'll have a decent little product eventually. It's not going to happen overnight. So that's more of a policy statement that the ordinance for parking would be separate or part of this? Yeah. It, it is separate. It would be separate. I'm, yeah. I'm just saying I'm going to work on the policy part first. Um, I'm pretty sure in the stack of paper I've got the parking ordinance. And, you know, I might do a line through strikeout, but it's not going to be handled. The humane homeless policy is just directed of how the city is uh, views. Uh, treatment right. uh, that the parking no it's just everybody I mean it's I mean I mean add another line to our parking ordinance and just prohibit RVs we throw up the signs and that's enforcement for everyone period sure and what about limiting city park hours and you guys react to that To me, it is problematic to dictate somebody's schedule that's wanting, walking, wanting to walk their dog at 5 a.m. 
or through a wall for the dog to fly in the city park. It's daylight during the summer, yeah. nine or ten, so it just seems un unusable. You know, we have people walking, doing, you know, doing their walking in the middle of the night with a flashlight. I'm not sure we should be regular. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a dirty thing. And in the winter time, again, it's we don't have population of people in the park. And I believe, because right now, you know, the way that the department is, is being is staffed at the moment, we will have people driving by the park at 2 a.m. and say, yeah, there's two people in there. They'll either call the business line to Seaside or 911. And then we get called because there's two people sitting on a picnic bench at 2 a.m. in the park. So get up out of bed, get dressed, come out and tell the people to leave the park. I mean, it's, we don't have park rangers, you know, to do that. And again, if we, I, I'm looking at it for a few incidents versus many incidents of just general normal activity, do we want to eliminate all this just because of this? We could have a no time camping in the park. Yeah. I mean, you know, if we, you could, if you want your parks to be open twenty four hours, if someone wants to sleep with a blanket, they could do that. But as far as pitching a tent, that can be prohibited um, because that that's a prohibition <laughs> that applies to every other property owner in the city. So. so, would that be part of the policy, or is there? No, that would, that would be an ordinance that you have that there's no tents allowed in the park because it's for everybody. Do we already have a tent or camping ordinance? Well, our camping ordinance applies to private property. Only. Um, because if you recall, before our short-term um, rental ordinance went into effect, people were also pitching tents in the yards of the STRs. Could we revise that one? We could revise that. I mean, I would rather... All the, no but we have stuff. we have we have tents in vacation, not just vacation rentals, but in other people's homes all the time. People that are living there put up a tent and have their kids go out and stay in their backyard. So are we going to terminate that? Well, isn't isn't a lot of our enforcement complaint driven? Yeah, but you can have a neighbor that's just a nasty neighbor that turn somebody in because they don't like the fact that their kids are out having a sleep, you know, sleep out in the tent night versus one that does it all the time and nobody says a word about it. That's not fair enforcement either. I think I think it probably makes sense. We I recall there being a major kerfuffle regarding loading and unloading RVs, what, six, seven years ago. There was that English gentleman, his neighbors constantly called in. And we had a pretty prescriptive RV policy related to that. So it might make sense to look at that, look at our tenant one, and see if we can just make some minor tweaks to those and make sure that it's understood that that applies to public property. Well, this ordinance that was attached to this whole homelessness thing on the other side of this cover page. Section one says overnight camping prohibited. And if you just added the word tents, that was all you really need, all you really need to do. Because it includes public parks. So overnight sleeping is banned. I just put in the word tents. Or you can put in your yard, in yards, or on private property. Do we think if we're going to 
eliminate motorhomes in certain areas of the community, should we have a spot that we can send them? Like Seaside is, is done for years along the Camp River there on the west side is where they designated the RV parking for the community. It's, it's backfiring on the main now, but that you know worked for a lot of years. Um, do we feel like we need a space like that? If we could find a place, I think it would be good. I'm not sure where it would be. Um, I sure don't like it when they park this direction and the parking spots are like this, but I don't like them much better when they're sticking out into the road. So, you know, like down in Cannon Beach, they're angled, but they're in a big, big parking area. The city parking park chamber, I guess, would be the yeah. beach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a thick of the parking lot that's, that's striped for mm -hmm. RVs specifically. Um, I mean, I don't know if we have that much RV traffic. I, I guess that would be a question for you, Jeff. But we have we have the transit type traffic that come in for the day and spend the night and then move on down the coast one way or the other because they don't want to stay at Fort Stevens or one of the RV camps. They do do that. You know, here I'm talking about the 1962 Volkswagen van with six surfboards on top and they're here to surf the coast for a week. Now they're coming over here because everybody told them you're hard safe from the seaside, you get your tire slashing. <laughs> Not saying that that's always the case, but I, I still, my feeling is, is that with this new House Bill 3115 that will take effect <clears throat> July 1st, 2023, one of the number A in section one, it says, the definition keeping warm and dry means using measures necessary for an individual to survive outdoors given the environmental conditions. Tent. I don't think that means a tent. I mean, the 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 grant pass case said, you know, when as far as sleeping bag. They, I mean, they were trying to prevent the sleeping. And you can't do that. Right. But I don't, you know, as soon as we, as soon as we allow tents, then, then it's more than a tent, then it's the um, wooden structure underneath the tent. And then the next thing is a wooden structure and, or something that looks like a yurt that has a chimney coming out of the top of it. Mm -hmm. So that during the winter that they can stay warm. And then that's a that's a risk to that person's health and safety. And so, you know, and that's that creates an issue if we want to follow our health and safety housing codes. I mean, I'm not if you're if you build essentially a shed out of recycled wood with a narrow doorway and you put a stove in it or propane or whatever it is. Um, open flame, it's only a matter of time before, particularly if, if someone's under the influence of substances where it could get kicked over and went on fire and they kicked out. And but under, under House Bill 3115, that would not be allowed because they actually put it in there that fire is not anything that involves fire or flame, uh, it's not part of keeping the one in black. So I'm not saying allowed tents or not allowed tents. I'm just saying where where are we going to run with this? But I think we should keep it narrowly defined to what's affecting us now, which isn't a whole lot, versus encompassing that. If I have my grandkids over, I can't put up a tent in the backyard and go out and sleep with them. No, but I think DeAndre is a good point. I mean, maybe we don't have that perfect place for RV parking, but I think we should always be thinking about that. 
do we own the property like it's directly north of where we're at here? I mean, we have the driveway that goes out. Correct. Is there, is there any? They can park right now on Civic Way before you get to the tennis courts. There's a lot of that grass section. They, I've seen RVs park there. This is a nice wide spot. But some people don't park there thinking that it's somebody's yard. Right. We could actually, we own it. We could put up a sign that says RV parking permitted. Then people will pull their RVs off just west of the post officer into the grass area. That is ours, correct? That is. Okay. That you were talking about as a septic system. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, not so good then. <laughs> I, had a, I had a dozen Greyhound buses there once when they brought down a whole herd of kids. I mean, this was a long time ago. It was like about 25 years. But they asked, is there any place to park buses? And I went, yeah, right up here. And they all piled them in there. And it was close to the kids. Uh, we could designate the sign saying RV parking. Then that way, if we're taken away from the park and that way, it's not a huge walk for anybody because I have found inconveniencing people too much, they're just going to go ahead and do what they want anyways. Right. And, and that's why for 10th Street Beach Access, I load everybody up on the canopy. The homeowners think they own out to the street there, but that's our gravel right away. And people are parking on both sides because that's where I'm telling them to go. Because on the big weekends, I've been sitting on 10th Street. People go, well, where can we park middle? The street right up here on your right hand side, and you park right up there. And it works out. Same thing, Wellington was completely packed last weekend mm -hmm. besides the street on the way that it stops on. And I don't know that we could do too much more with the Wellington property. Um, we have that whole street uh, right of way that we can continue on with those trees are at. And it's also the south and area right of way that goes back to the east. And I think that on some of these areas, if we did a little bit of improvement to them, clearing, making them nicer or gravel, cheap, people would have a tendency to want to park there more. And there's many homes in this city that they put their grass all the way up to the street's edge and people don't want to park there thinking it's somebody's yard. <laughs> I guess the question is, do you want a lot of RVs? Because if you don't want a lot of RVs, then, I mean, I, I think that the mayor's identified from a pedestrian and uh, cyclist standpoint that there's some areas where we would want to prohibit RVs. Mm -hmm. But then, the, so then the question becomes, do you, if, if you, if you have a place where you explicitly permit RVs, then my experience has been then you're going to get a lot of people RVing as a culture, whether it's an $800,000 RV or a non-mobile. And then word travels fast that, oh, this idyllic beach town has a assigned spaces for RVs in this area, which then attracts, again, whether they're a million dollars, you know, whether it's Dolly Parton's tour bus or whether it's a, you know, 1970 Winnebago that can barely run, they're going to park in the place that welcomes them to park, which would be the place where we're putting RVs. So if we want a lot of people to park on our roads in our RVs or cars, then you make improvements for them to park. Um, and I just don't know if that's the outcome you necessarily want. Can you regulate that some just by giving it, you know, one night? Two night maximum or something like that too. Or just daytime or yeah. just daytime. Yeah, I mean I think that it makes sense for us to look at our RV parking ordinance because I remember we spent a we spent months drafting that. Councilor Jesse remembered that too. too. Yeah. <laughs> Chad remembered. There were a lot of people who were very upset 
There was one finished. woman who was upset. Very upset. Yes. One woman, and then she moved away as soon as she got it. <laughs> Just so give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't unload his RV in four hours. She wanted him to unload it. She wanted his RV to be there for four hours. Yeah, all sorts of it was all sorts of uh, excitement. We gotta wrap this discussion up. It's Our quarter time. to eight. Well beyond. Um, hopefully, what I originally intended. But great discussion. Um, construction noise. Um, that, I wanna pick this, this up a little bit. Well, oh, sure. And uh, actually, uh, you call and help me with this, but. Essentially, we have construction periods of time here in your heart where contractors can do their work uh, on a commercial basis. This includes landscapers, and there's also provisions, as you see, uh, for the golf course or for them to maintain it sometime. And the history of your heart, I thought it would be important that uh, they were able to have a little bit of extended time, both uh, earlier in the day and in the evening. Neighbors have, you know, with, with the amount of building that's been going on lately and the struggle to find enough people to build and the amount of work that needs to be done with the, the very few contractors that are available, it's turning out that a lot of work is being done commercially on the weekends. And this has created, uh, you know, a, a little bit of heartburn with the people that live next to these places because there just really does not seem to be much in the way of relief. Uh, for sometimes weeks, if not a couple of months on end. So the conversation that we're having here tonight is basically what changes, if any, could we make to help alleviate that if the council so desires. And when we're talking about contract or landscaper, we're talking about work hours, not noise. We already have a noise ordinance. So this is ordinance 876 deals just with days of the week and time that contractors and landscapers can work. And I believe you guys all have my synopsis that I sent out, yeah. you know, and the worst, I think the worst thing you can do is saying on Saturday and Sundays, you can't use air compressors, generators, nail guns, saws, because they all make too much noise, but you can use hand hammers. And it's too confusing for contractors and even the landscapers. And the, lands, and the reason why I'm saying landscapers is because I watch them come in with their big heavy equipment and it makes noise, you know, all day long. So if, if the true sense with this ordinance that residents, when a day or two of rest from commercial building or commercial landscaping, then you terminate a day or you terminate two days. In doing that, it's going to be a lot easier to enforce. It's a lot easier to get the word out rather than trying to tell everybody that, yeah, Monday through Friday, you can use air compressors, but on Saturdays and Sundays, you can't. And next thing you know, there's going to be a new tool that's not going to be covered under this ordinance that makes twice as much noise as what we're trying not to do. So if, if the council leaving the golf course with their limited, because there's this low noise mowers, especially like for the green mowers, you don't even hear them. You see them going back and forth, but it makes no noise whatsoever. We've carved out the special times for them to start, especially in the summertime. They're not out there mowing at 4 a.m. in January. It's not happening. They're out there now at five o'clock in the morning when I'm driving through. They're out there mowing because the course is opening up at eight o'clock or before 
and they're off and going. So if, if the complaints or concerns are, you know, hey, it'd be nice to have a day of rest from all landscaping and all commercial constructing, and it's gonna be about that time the guy's going to, next door to you is gonna be built a 10 by 12 work shed uh, with his generator compressors nailed against, but he gets to because he's not commercial. Say no commercial construction or landscaping on a Saturday or a Sunday. The landscapers, um, they can change up their clients of when they mow. You know, if they're mowing someone here on, on a Sunday, they can trade with somebody in Seaside or wherever else, Pinehurst County, just change up the day and just saying, hey, I can't mow my client in Gearheart on Sunday anymore. I'm glad you brought that up. I was confused too, because the way I read these two ordinances that if you're a contractor, you can't run your power saw on the weekends, but if you're a homeowner, you can. So I was kind of confused. Well, it's commercial. That's what ordinance 876 is about. Right. It's commercial. That's well, not home. But on the other on the other one about homeowners, it doesn't mention um compressors and power saws. That but that's under the noise ordinance. And we're not dealing with noise okay. here. Right. We're only dealing with, with when you can work. Okay. We separated yeah. that out because Judge Orr made a ruling where we only had one ordinance at one time and we split them out and created this 876. So do you guys have something in uh, the police department that can measure the decibels? Yes. Okay. But that's under the noise yes. ordinance one. Right. So, I mean, you have a contractor right now next to it and it's 10 a.m. And he's running his compressors, nail guns, and everything else, which decibels are high on. But the house just down the street, they have their music playing, and they can only be at such decibels. So we aren't really the noise. It's if the council is going to do something to limit just the activity, it would be Truly, cutting out a day and, or two. And, and what I think you're saying is that you're not really recommending any changes in 877. No, because 877 does not apply to contractors during their working hours. So 877 is a 877 applies from 10 p.m. to 8 a.m to any noise based on that school. So it doesn't matter whether it's a soft or a, um, you know, usually it doesn't matter. It's just noise. So if, if what's bothering people is noise on weekends, then I think that the spot to do it would be the, maybe we adjust the times. Maybe it's 10, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays so that people don't get woken up early. I don't know. Um, to me, whether it's, I mean, I, I disagreed with Judge Ward's ruling. I thought this was an abs abs absurd distinction that he made because um, it shouldn't, in my mind, matter if it's someone's livelihood or whether they're a hobbyist that happens to have own a lot of power tools and be quite handy and be able to do their own thing. What does it matter? What's upsetting people is the noise. Um, maybe it is the noise from 12 people on a site versus one person, but what if it's your body coming over and they're giving the labor for free? I mean, that's not commercial contracting either. And so, you know, I mean, at the risk of seeming like I'm questioning Judge Orr, it just didn't, the ruling in the first place didn't make sense to me. Um, but, I guess it is the are people upset because the construction noise is happening on the weekends, or are they? I mean, what what really is the issue that they're upset about? It, the issue is that the noise is coming from 
multiple sites, multiple simultaneous builds going on, and it's starting early in the morning and going until 9 30, 10 o'clock at night. We already have an ordinance in place for that, but not being enforced. We're not being called. So being called. I, I think that the so then if that's the case, if the case is that and you know I drove around here hard to see, and boy, there's a lot of construction going on there, it sure looks like, including a giant structure going up behind the house with the flat roofs. Um double walks up that way. Okay. But so if if it truly we could. I mean, if they want to bring a painting crew on the weekend, no one's going to notice. It seems like what the issue is, the nailing guns or power slots, or is that it? Uh, yeah, it's dump trucks, oh. dumping fill. Uh, it is backhoes spreading the fill. It is digging the foundations. It is building the forms. It is dumping the concrete. It is nail guns. And the painters are using compressors and your sheet rockers are using their machinery. So, so would we want to would we want to adjust the weekend time when the activity would we want to adjust the noise ordinance for weekend time? Because that's going to be the easiest way to regulate the activity versus saying. This contractor regulation, I mean, it just, we had to do what we had to do. Right? All right, so can you point that out to me? Is that on page three, number three? So if you look at number 877, um, under page three, um, Operating domestic power equipment in such a manner as to be plainly audible within the dwelling unit, other than the source of the sound between the hours of 10, excuse me, 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. is kind of the noise ordinance portion of that contracting activity. And the if you look at the sound producing device includes, and that's page two, um, G. Domestic tools, including electric drills, chainsaws, lawnmowers, electric saws, hammers, and similar tools, but only between 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. So it's it's setting forth that there's no none of that activity between 10 and 8, regardless of the status of whoever's doing it. Um, and uh, you know, if 10 p.m., I mean, 8 to 10 is a is a longer duration than some jurisdictions. Some of them start earlier and they end earlier. Some of them start later. I mean, it's just, there's no magic number, but if we want to regulate noise, um, then that, this would be the easiest spot to put it. Your already has, in all the jurisdictions I work, which is basically a story through man's data, we have the most stringent hour regulations. Okay. All right. So, I don't work with my crews on weekends, so I can't answer that. I know, I know that man's, I'm not normal. Man's, well, yeah. man's in either there's no construction on Saturdays down there. So, that's, that's what they did for what you refer to as the day of rest. Yeah. And our old ordinance that we had, you know, that then got uh, died with a new ordinance. Uh, that was actually Monday through Fridays and no commercial construction on the weekends. So not, not to argue with the the, the city attorney, but from policing standpoint or enforcement standpoint, the easiest of all is if you don't want building and landscaping taking place seven days a week, then terminate a day or two and 
that is easier to enforce. It's easy, and there's always a learning curve. Just because the ordinance went into effect doesn't mean that everybody knows. But if you terminated, and I know Dan's a contractor, but if you terminated building on Sundays and landscapers on Sundays, we could get the word out and I would do change even these other signs that I have, and I'm gonna have more of the signs going out, but they all get stolen during 4th of July. That's why I've been hesitant to put too many out. In fact, on Creekside, that's already developed where the three houses are growing. I put two signs down there and they've already taken those. I think it's the neighbors because they don't like the look of the signs at the end of the street. But these, I still, my opinion is 876, uh, redo it and terminate that there's no commercial construction or landscaping on Sundays or Saturdays and Sundays or holidays or whatever you want to do. Just terminate that activity and we can get that word out a lot easier. And the building department can get that out a lot more versus times. Just from my law enforcement standpoint. And when people do call us, if it's seven o'clock in the morning, we come out and we make them go get coffee where everybody gets $500 citation. If they're after hours, the one leeway group that we kind of get a little bit of leeway to, of course, is the guys that are doing concrete. Because you got a pour, and in this area, I don't care, high humidity, whatever, not all pours are done at 6 p.m. Sometimes they're still out there trolling at 7 or 8. And I can't tell them to stop. And they don't want a $500 citation. So, right. But anybody that is stick framing with nail gun, roofers, whoever, um, we'll enforce it. I mean, it's easy. You just go up to them and say it's quit time or a $500 citation. And these guys that aren't the contractor that are working for the contractor, they're all bailing off the job. They, because the contractor's not on scene at six o'clock at night. The workers are. Because the contractor told to stay over and get this thing jammed. <laughs> Contractors are home. I'd really like to see it have it more touring on Saturdays and Sundays. Because I think it's a good idea. But I have another question for you, Chief. I noticed in the noise ordinances there was no provisions for loud barking animals. You ever get that's under the barking dog ordinance. <laughs> <laughs> And that's, that's, a, that's a whole new topic than, right. than what we're here tonight. And that has to be four hours continuous. No. no. Dogs have to continuously, define continuously, bark at least four times for five minutes within a one hour period. <laughs> wow. For it to be a violation. That's what we came up with. Yeah. So why isn't that in the noise ordinance? Because it's under the Barking dog. No, oh, it's under the dog ordinances for and barkings in them. because we had to update the dog ordinance because the old ordinance says thou shalt not have a barking dog. So my question was, do you get a lot of complaints about barking dogs or not? No, not a lot. Well, I don't think we get a lot of complaints. There are people that will call and I talk to them, and it is funny that that when I tell them, you know, what I'll go do, and then, you know, they'll get a formal warning letter, because we have to do that. And then the next time that they're in violation, they get a $500 ticket. The neighbor doesn't want that because they don't want to be the bad neighbor that gave their other neighbor a $500 ticket. Now there are some that said, yeah, can you make it $5,000? <laughs> But I don't think that we have a lot of them because it's it is pretty hard. When I go down there, I body cam for 21 minutes. That's using the four five-minute ones. And there's always a lull. 
that they're not, <laughs> that they're not continuously <laughs> at 20 minutes. And, <laughs> and with the court's rulings, uh, you don't get citizens' arrests on municipal court violations anymore. So we have to witness it to issue the citation. Uh, so it's reasonable about the park. <laughs> going back to this construction thing, I know Brett called me early on in his discussion about what did I think about this. And I was much more um, sympathetic to Brent than my wife was when I went home that day. And she's really kicked off actually at the idea of limiting people's ability to make money. And what you're doing by taking away days at work is you really are limiting somebody's ability to make money. And this building economy that we have right now, it is booming. And people really should be taking advantage of that if that's important. And unfortunately, I'm in my career where I just don't, I don't have to work as hard as I used to. When I was in my youth, I worked seven days a week, a lot of times. I work here in your heart during the week, and I go work in Seaside on the weekend because it was the ordinance back then. But the ability, this is going to crash, and it's going to crash hard, and I think it could crash rather soon. And so people having the ability to you know, put all their nuts in a basket so they have something to eat. When it does crash, I think they actually it has. Carrie, I've heard much from you. I'm just listening, taking it all in. I see Rita's point. I see Dan's point. I think if we can uh, carve out Sunday, that's a compromise, and uh, I agree with you as far as a crash in the building section of life. Um, maybe we can revisit it at that time because nobody will be working. I, I, I do think it's going to solve itself real soon. Mm -hmm. I really do. It's unsustainable. What's going on? Yeah, that is true. Especially if the prices things are yeah. just like. And in 2011, I was the 15th house to go into the reserve. That was a 130 lot development. And it's we're almost built up. So for, for 10 years, I've been dealing with the construction, whether it was next door across the street or the trucks going by or whatever. But I'm the type of person that doesn't complain about the airplanes when I build a house next to an airport. I'm not the type of person that's going to complain about development in a development. So that's, that's just me. I built my house and when a few people were there because the economy was already crashed and a lot of the houses were in bankruptcy, but I built my house. I made the noise, there was the parking and everything else. And so now for 10 years, I tolerated it because I knew it was gonna happen because I built some of the development. And hopefully it all gets done here pretty soon because it'd be kind of nice not to have it all. And I'm glad the economy picked up the way it did because the houses are just being slammed in there and we don't have hardly any left really for lots for people to build up. Unless you ask for the state. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, experts would say that we have 400 or whatever it is. Um, you know, I think one of the, if we're looking at this and the defensibility of it, that is a consideration is that I think everyone agrees there's an acute shortage of housing on the Oregon coast. And so anything we do that, you know, further restricts the ability for um, housing to get built or makes it more expensive is something that we're going to need to really carefully justify from a legal standpoint. Because if you look at Oregon's planning goals, Goal 10 variety of housing. You know, if, if anything we do, whether it's increasing SPCs or, or limitations 
um, we we need to kind of be able to defend that. And that doesn't that doesn't mean that that what we have now is perfect or couldn't be improved or that we can't have further restrictions because I think we could. Um, I think we just we we need to do those in a way that that would minimize any harm that could be caused as far as making things more expensive. So that is one consideration. I, I, I think that housing will continue to be built because there's just such an acute shortage now. And particularly workforce housing, I think more and more jurisdictions, regardless of what our mobile lands and historic housing needs analysis and Portland states projection that over the next 50 years are going to be 70 new houses that are going to need to be built. Which, I mean, how many dwellings have we permitted in the last 72 or 36 months? Uh, I got to get that number at that point, but it's been I mean, before we built more houses this year than we built last year. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're averaging, I think we're over 40 houses this year, and we were around 35 last year. So in that two year period, we've and keep in mind, Portland State was projecting our need starting in 2017, projecting out 50 years, and we and then they revisited it and dropped our number from 70 to something less, and we've now exceeded that number in the first three years. Um, and I think once we get our census, it's going to. I would hope other cities will look at these numbers as well and look about whether we actually have lots or phantom lots or these are phantom lots and understanding that almost any multi-family structure that was built pre-1990 is counted as being redevelopable so those are lots as well even though those will probably never redevelop at that higher density because that rents are marginally higher and you're taking them offline for a year and then have all the construction permitting costs so um, i would hope we could have more of a global look on the coast and some of the other communities would understand the numbers. Um, but, you know, this seems to be a larger question, but we'll get some data points very soon as far as the size of the numbers. Any other comments? Yeah, um, and yeah, I appreciate your comments. Yeah, I I am in favor of people making them also. Uh, I also think everything needs balance. And so many jurisdictions do have limitations on the days that contractors can work. Uh, and, and maybe we have been, this has been a particularly hard year on residents. A lot of people are locked in their homes because of COVID. And that sanctuary is continually bombarded by pretty terrible noise. Um, people generally are not in a good psychological place to begin with. And then they have uh, continual, very loud noise, rumbling, vibration is becoming a more common thing to the, the fill that's going in up along the creek. Many of the houses it really didn't get compacted, so there's been some settling right off the bat. So the, the contractor is trying to address that. So he's brought in some new equipment. And uh, it's a gigantic steamroller that has a built in vibrator. <laughs> uh, and it's not the good kind of vibrator. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now we've got the entire house doing this, and we've got cracking sheet rock. And so it, it is, there are remedies for that. Moving? No. You, if you damage somebody else's house and you're in the construction process, yeah, there is that. And they've got 
I am a lawyer and go to court. And yes, I am. I realize that. I'd rather not do that. But as far as this issue, I love to see at least one day additional silence. I would prefer two days, but even one day of silence and maybe one Saturday of you know 10 o'clock start time instead of would be a good compromise. So I'll throw that out there. What about the holidays? Which holidays are we referring to? Monday. <laughs> So like the 5th of July? If that's the federal or... And that is a federal day. Gonna, is that when you're going to be closed? Yeah. But yeah, you know, when you celebrate the weekend holiday on Monday, whatever that's called. So I'm in my industry, I'm not aware of anybody that shuts down for those type of holidays. I fell off a roof Christmas day. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go. You should have taken the day off. Yeah, yeah. 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 Even, even for the, the landscapers and stuff, it's just a regular day of work. It's on their schedule. This is when they're doing it. It doesn't matter that it's a holiday. The only time I'd say that in a, for a work standpoint, when they consider the holiday is when they're going on vacation with the kids. I mean, that's, otherwise, a Memorial Day, Labor Day, any other holiday like that, they're all working. Gerhardt is no different on a Labor Day than the Friday before, or the Thursday before, or the Wednesday before. They're working. So, and then trying to educate everybody of what holidays they are. And this year I have an argument. They say, no, the 4th of July was a holiday. That was on a Sunday. I'm here on Monday. I, I think that the, the easiest way to do it would be if you want to do one day a week, if you want to adjust the time on weekends. Um, I mean, I, what I hear Chief saying that he needs and, and the contractors need is kind of uniformity so they just understand that if it's Sunday, you know, it's just like Manzanita, they need to schedule their work in Seaside or the jurisdiction where it's allowed. And if it's Saturday, maybe that they don't start before 10 a.m., maybe it's 10 to 6, maybe it's whatever the reasonable hours are, understanding that, you know, you're balancing competing interests here and, and, um, you know, mental health is important and building houses is important. And, you know, somewhere there's probably a compromise that would, would, would work out. And that, that just needs to be something that she's able to clearly communicate with people so they understand that their new rules will be made. And just, and it would make it easier for enforcement for us. I mean, you know, we've gone from where lawyers used to be the most hated group to where I think we took their place now. <laughs> <laughs> and so to, to work with things that are defined and it's here is so much easier to relate to people and get it across so you're not getting emails. There aren't spam emails going to everybody that you know the cops did this or the cops did that. I mean, it's it's simple. And again, it would be a curve if we if you guys decide to cut out on Sundays. Some contractors show up on a Sunday, but don't call me Monday and say there was one there on Sunday because I'm going to hurt your feelings and say. Call me next Sunday if he shows back up. You know, I mean, that type of thing. If either, you know, that's where I try to get with, with other people and talk to them that if they're showing up at 7 a.m., give me a call when they show up so we can go talk to them. We'll make it a point to be there. I mean, granted, we can go talk to them at 11 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the afternoon and go, hey, you guys showed up too early. Don't show up, you know before seven tomorrow, 
that kind of flies out of the air. I'd rather just say, hey, great, I'm glad you guys are here. Sit and drink your coffee because you can't start work till eight o'clock. And then they have to sit there for an hour out on the clock doing anything. That's a memorable moment for them. So any last thoughts on this? So the, I'm gonna go back to the winter of 2001, 2002. My memory banks, that's the worst winter we've had here hard in 26 years I've been in business. And we averaged working, we were building the condominiums down oceanfront in um, where the old Oceanside restaurant used to be. And we averaged working three and a half days out of the seven day work week all winter long. And we worked whatever days we could, that the weather would allow to try to get people as close to five days of work and work week as possible. That was a, not a normal winter, but it was a brutal one. And so I do have a concern, especially when we deal with roofers and people that are doing things that have to be done. We're going to try shooting a roof when it's 12 and 50. It isn't going to happen. So when you're at that stage in the project, you sit all week and, and nobody works because you're waiting for the right weather to to sheet that roof. And oh, by the way, Saturday and Sunday were gorgeous, but we can't work. Then, you know, we need to think about how this impacts people. There's one thing when it's summertime, it's beautiful. And there's another thing when it's January and February, and there aren't many people around anyway. Now you're feeling it because you're, or you, you felt it because you're in a subdivision area that was not built out, but and I guess from my point of view, I don't end up in working in those environments that often. You know, I'm often working on South Ocean where you can shoot a cannon down the street most of, most of the winter and not have to worry about it. Um, we're cognizant of what we do there in the summertime. And, and I purposely will kick my crew out for the entire 4th of July. You know, nobody can work for this four-day period here because we're going to make the neighbors mad and there are potential clients next time. So we don't want to make them mad. Which is different than, you know, I'm building building a house here in my you know, this one. I'm going to go right next door and build another one. You know, it's a different thing. But weather is a consideration here, especially. Absolutely, is and my wife used to be a contractor. She built a lot of homes, so she knows about customer relations and working with the neighbors meeting with them and saying look normally this is how i would do it but the weather i've got a window coming up i need to work on saturday or sunday it's okay i'm giving you a heads up and usually they would say sure that that's perfect i appreciate the heads up but you're also then at that point if you have an ordinance that says something and you're you're selectively enforcing it again there's a, you know, there's a problem. It, well, it's, it is selective in that you won't get complaints. Yeah, it's all of our, all of our farther complaint driven. So if, you know, unless something obviously illegal is happening, then if people don't mind the tent in the backyard, then no one's going to say anything and no one's going to call the police. Or more often than not, it's people complaining about it, but not calling the police. Um, and then why aren't you enforcing this? Like, because you do. Or call it the next day. Yeah. But the nighttime ones, I mean, we will, and it doesn't have to be complaint driven, we will drive around and look to see who's still working. And sometimes, yeah, there's some contractors working. So, hey, guys, it's six o'clock, you to leave. Can you give me 10 minutes? Because I drove down here from Portland and Kit, and this is all I have left to do with my job. I'm not going to kick them off and say, okay, four hour drive to come back and do it for 10. We tell them, we'll be back here at 6 30, and then you get a $500 citation. And that means that you're packed up and gone. And most of them aren't. I mean, there's reason. You always have somebody that's not reasonable. And then those are the ones you just give the $500 citation to and say, come to court. 
Any idea how many citations you issue a year to contractors? Is it very, very few? Yeah. Very few. Because most of them get it. I mean, for that extra hour of working, do you want a five hundred dollar ticket? Even if the judge cuts it to two fifty, is it worth it? And when I tell them, there's seven guys on the crew there, and I said, everyone, just give me your ID. You should all get five hundred dollar tickets. <laughs> They walk off. Yeah. They walk off, and you know, and tell the boss, "I'm not working for an hour, but you're still paying me for it because I'm here on site." I mean, that's between them. But if if people let us know, we can kind of curb it because there is in the reserve. There's very few issues going on there now than what happened when the building restarted up again and we we're getting a lot of Portland contractors. It, it was a curve, but now it's all better. And just like the parking out there, in the reserve, it's legal to illegal park on one side of the street. Because where are you gonna put them? You can't put them all down in the swell. And everything. So it's working with them. And when Creekside really starts going, you know, I've been driving down there, discreet concrete doing that form. If they're starting early, let me know. If they're working late, let us know. But it's not a 911 call. Or no. Call Seaside Dispatch and say you need to get hard officer. And we'll come. I mean, because I'd rather handle it on the front end. Than the back end of things, because who knows what the next court ruling out of here would be. So it's not good to call the non-emergency. Not here. Well, thank you for leaving me the voice message. <laughs> you know, I'm saying if you call Seaside PD 738-6311, said, hey, I need a your heart officer. You know, I got a contract to start at seven o'clock in the morning. We'll come out. We're going to wrap it up, guys. We're here for two hours. Great discussion. What I, what I need to know from y'all is on this whole topic, uh, is this something that you want to see on the agenda as soon as next week? Uh, or do we want to let it percolate in our heads for a month and then get back to it? And I'm trying to get to a point where somebody will have something to say that would be a motion so we can have discussion. I, hope, I would hope that um, if we're going to change the ordinance and limit construction hours, that uh, notice is given in a better fashion to contractors than just what happens to be you know, noticed on the block. Sign in the building department office or something so people understand what, what's going to happen. Typically, uh, the building department, when they get rules like this, that we can't that everybody goes with every permit. And some of them are even. But I'm talking about pre, like, I think it would be appropriate for the building community to understand that this is a potential that's going to happen. Yeah, they were, they were quite interested already. Yeah, right. it will have a public hearing. Attached to it at some point, though. It was when this first came out, I was already calling contractors because I have them in my phone. Mm -hmm. From calling them because of issues that's going on <laughs> at their sites. And I believe I called you. You did. And I called other contractors just to give them a heads up. And it could be the same way that if you guys did change something. It's notification like that, and it's also going to job sites, the personal appearance. It's not just if you actually picked up a city license, which is nothing but a text document anyways, and it's written in small print down there that that's, this is what it is. That's what I'm saying. If it's, if it's well defined out, the word can get out. Is it going to get to every subcontractor that's up from the metro area? No, but they'll catch on if they're doing more jobs down there. The first job may be a hassle, but the second job, 
they got it. So it's not going to be difficult to do what you want as long as we can make it simple. Right. So what I'm hearing is that earliest we'd want to do it so that to ensure because it's this will be after all day to ensure like goal one public participation will be August probably because chief and others would want to be in contact with people so that they would understand this was an agenda item so that they could um, offer public testimony or in person or in writing mm -hmm. or I guess not in person would be a phone <laughs> Right. Well, I'll definitely uh, give a report um, at the council meeting next week. So at least we've got it in our conversation, we've got it in our public record. And we'll hold on any agenda. And we can get it up on the blog and start getting the word out to everybody that come August council meeting, you guys will be discussing potentially change to ordinance 876. All right, are we ready to adjourn? I will be adjourned. I will be adjourned. I'll second. I have to do that, but. <laughs> 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 Thank, you. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. And Chief, it was great having you here. I loved it. Thank you so much. Get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> you had you had your candy for this meeting. <laughs> Enjoy it. Uh, but calls. Okay. I mean, some people do.